Welcome back, America. Senator Tom Cotton is a member of the Senate Intelligence Committee, so I assume he knows that Ohio State will dominate this weekend's game. Senator Cotton, welcome. Are you a Buckeye or a Wolverine this weekend? <laughs> well, every weekend I'm an Arkansas Razorback. You, I, I will say I have a soft spot uh, in my heart for the game. Sixteen years ago, uh, this past weekend, the Saturday before Thanksgiving, my men and I had just gotten out of Iraq and were sitting in a tent in Kuwait waiting for our plane back to the United States for three years. And that was the, the so-called game of the century when both teams went in 11 nothing under yep. Lloyd Carr and Jim Trestle. And I'm sure you remember that was a narrow Ohio State victory. Big game. They've been talking a lot about it on Buckeye Talk. And this is the 11-0 and 11-0 and uh, meeting. Both of them could end up in the, in the playoffs. But you're gonna, that was a diplomatic way of saying you're not going to say Michigan or Ohio, Senator Cotton. I wish uh, Buckeye Nation and Wolverine Nation all, all the best, but I'll be rooting for the uh, Arkansas Razorbacks this weekend. As all that is the perfect lead-in. That's how I approach the Republican race for president in 2024, and you have taken yourself out of that race, so it's good to ask you. The RJC, Republican Jewish Com Coalition, met in Las Vegas, and we had our first runway event, and everybody showed. Uh, president, former President Trump showed up by video, everyone else in person. So it's off. The, the starter gun has started. What do you expect in terms of the number of people who will run? And what is your advice to talk show hosts who are being told by National Review this morning that we are, quote, power brokers, which is the first and I think the last time I'll ever be referred to as such? <laughs> um, well, I was not uh, in attendance in Las Vegas at the Republican Jewish Coalition. But that's a great organization. Matt Brooks has turned it into a real powerhouse, if you will, in Republican politics. And they commend them for having such an uh, impressive lineup. Um, I, since I'm not a candidate, Hugh, I, I don't intend to be a, a pundit or a strategist in a cycle. Um, like all Republicans, I'll be watching the candidates and wishing them all very well. But I, I do think there's a common set of ideas or themes um, that any Republican running for president um, is probably going to need to advance and that our voters expect to hear. A lot of these are what I write about in Only the Strong to how, to, how to restore the sinews of American power after four years of Joe Biden's tenure, really the third uh, four-year term of Barack Obama's presidency. So obviously we need to significantly rebuild our military. We need to increase defense spending substantially. We also need to refocus uh, our military, getting them back to the blocking and tackling of, of war fighting, being ready to fight tonight, not worrying about which pronouns our drill sergeants are using. Um, American energy production uh, needs urgent focus. We're going to try to do some of that in the new Congress. It might be hard with Chuck Schumer still running the floor of the United States Senate. Um, but America is the world's fossil fuel superpower. We should be producing more of our oil and gas and coal, not just for ourselves, but for the rest of the world. Um, we also have to take control of our southern border. Um, the crisis at our border didn't just happen. It's the result of Joe Biden's bad policy choices. So the next Republican president can do a lot to reverse those choices, as, as President Trump did in the final year of his presidency. Um, we also need to make sure that we are restoring trust and faith in America's credibility and strength abroad, especially as it relates to communist China. Um, so, again, I wish all the, all the potential candidates well. But I do think that our, our voters expect to hear their views on, on all those issues and, and many more, of course, too. I, I hope they're all carrying around this book, Only the Strong, because I, I do keep it handy because it's got the stats on rebuilding America's defense. Let me ask you, though, Senator, I have, I have urged the RNC, and I, I think they will reelect Ronda McDaniel as their chairperson. There are 168 people. I want them to get started early, if not with you know debates with everyone on a podium, then forums where four or five of them sit around and talk about how big should the Navy be, how many planes do we need, what kind of defense budget do we need. Do you think the RNC ought to be early out of the gate? Because those will generate audiences, and they would generate small dollar donors, and they would elevate the arguments that Republicans want to make, among themselves, of course, but also more broadly, what differentiates Republicans from Democrats. Do you want the RNC to get this thing going sooner or later? So um, I, I won't recommend certain dates to them or the number of debates. I, I will say in presidential politics, debates are obviously very different than they are in any other race. You're typically in a gubernatorial or a Senate campaign. You might have one or two debates, and it's a relatively sleepy affair, often on public television. Um, but as we saw in 2016 in our primary, as we saw in 2020 in the Democratic primary, the presidential debates matter a lot. This is where we test candidates um, on their knowledge of 
where they want to take their country and their ability to respond under scrutiny and pressure. So I think it's a good thing that the debate started relatively early in 2016. I think it, they started around July or August, perhaps. That's correct. Um, one Cleveland, other, July, one other Fox thing, News. I, I know that, yeah, and I know that, that Ron and McDaniel ha, has been working this over the last few years. I, I think in our primary debates, we no longer should be giving microphones to Democrats and reporters' clothing. I, I think most of your listeners will remember in 2012 when George Stephanopoulos, a former campaign operative for Bill Clinton, was obsessing endlessly about things like birth control in a Republican primary debate, an uh, issue about which no Republican uh, had spoken or had any plans to change the status quo. So I'd suggest that we need good, strong journalists, not conservative partisans necessarily, although you've done well in debates too, but people who have a reputation for fairness and will ask the kind of questions that Republican primary voters want to hear, not the kind of questions that Democratic operatives in Washington want to hear. You know, so someone like, say, a Brett Fair or uh, Martha McCallum, in, the, in that mold, not former Byron York, uh, Henry now. Olson, Mary Catherine Ham, Guy Benson. There is a long list of people who are neutral as to which Republican, but could ask good questions. You know, and, that's, uh, and those are all good examples of center-right opinion journalists. Um, there are, are plenty of, of good uh, you know, straight news reporters and news anchors, though, who could hold down the moderator chair. You could also maybe have debates that have a specific angle to them, like have someone such as Jennifer Griffin or Lucas Tomlinson if you wanted a debate to focus more on defense policy and the world. So there's a lot of great reporters and center-right opinion journalists out there who would be good moderators and questioners in our debates. We don't need Democratic partisans that are wearing reporters' clothes in those debates. Now, speaking of Democratic partisans wearing reporter clothes, Sam Bankman Freed. Uh, first of all, did you accept money from him? Uh, I did not, at least not to my knowledge. If, if he right. did, it didn't go very far. And I do not want people to refund it because they actually, they, they, some candidates who took SBF money are giving that to charity. Don't. The bankruptcy court's going to come claw that back from you. This morning, Reuters is reporting that Sam Bankman Freed, FTX, his parents and senior executives of the failed cryptocurrency exchange bought at least 19 properties worth $121 million in the Bahamas over the past two years, official property records show. All right, another, this is just a, this is a massive scandal run by Democrats, for Democrats, with an occasional contribution. Tom Emmers took 25 grand, I think, or 45 grand. He'll give that to the bankruptcy court, whatever. What do you think? Why did this happen? Where were the regulators, Senator Cotton? Um, well, I think one of the main reasons it didn't happen is that, Sam Bankman Freed was giving $40 million to Democratic causes. Yeah, I mean, he may have given five or $10,000 here to this or that Republican or the NRCC, but the vast amount of his money went to Democrats, often in six or even seven figure contributions. So the Democrats had a vested interest in holding him up um, as some kind of great millennial business leader. A second reason is, as, as we now know from his text messages and his direct messages, and sometimes just his open statement. Um, that he was uh, a patron saint of the so-called ESG movement, which is really just liberal politics dressed up as corporate governance. Um, I, I've been cautioning investment firms and law firms and businesses not to go in for this ESG uh, fraud, especially as it relates to oil and gas investing, because it could very well be a violation of antitrust laws, criminal antitrust laws, to say nothing of fiduciary duties that one has to shareholders. So, so Sam Bankman Freed, as by his own admission, you know, kind of mouthed all the right platitudes, all the left wing catechism uh, at the time he was building what increasingly seems like a Ponzi scheme. Now, there's a lot we don't know yet. It's still uh, breaking fast. And, and unfortunately, it looks like it may get worse for the investing public and his customers uh, as we learn more. But I, I think I've heard you call him Hugh the millennial Madoff, and I think yep. that's a well put term. Now, well, he is. And there are a million people that he owes money to that aren't going to get paid back. And I want uh, this to be dived in deeply. I, I know there will be a criminal prosecution here. I suspect there will be a criminal prosecution. So you won't want to get in the way of that. But as to the, your perch on judiciary and intel, uh, do you expect SBF to be sitting in front of you and answering questions? At, at some point, Hugh, I, I'm sure he's going to be in front of Congress. Remember, he's been in front of Congress already. The Democrats invited him in it in a friendly, cordial setting, even came to his defense 
uh, against any criticism. Let's just say I suspect it will be somewhat less friendly. Now, if you, in the end, it might be in the House of Representatives with the Republican chairman if the Democrats don't want to dig too deeply on what increasingly looks like a Ponzi scheme that in part helped feed the Democratic Party in the 2022 elections. Uh, a quick question about effective altruism, the movement in which he wrapped himself. I think it's all kind of seminars and, and blue check elites. Why not give money to Salvation Army and Prison Fellowship and the people who do the good work? I mean, why do we have to invent a new way of helping the poor, Senator Cotton? We know who helps the poor. Just give them money. Yeah, Hugh, I've had a couple of the advocates of so-called effective altruism describe it to me. Uh, again, it, it sounds like people trying to reinvent the wheel when there are plenty of good charities and churches out there doing great work for the poor here in America or for the uh, unfortunate all around the world. Um, I, I think in some cases that people just, as worked with him, want to get their picture on the cover of Forbes magazine or be invited to the, to the right left-wing nonprofit galas or, or Democratic parties. Uh, so, Senator, uh, c closing this down, in terms of the Herschel Walker campaign, does 50-50 matter on Senate Armed Services as opposed to 49-51? I'm telling people in Georgia they got to vote for Herschel because we need 50-50 on the Senate Armed Services Committee. Am I right? Yeah, there's no doubt that it matters a lot to you. At a 50-50 at a majority, or a 50-50 split on, on every committee, um, the Democrats can't unilaterally send uh, the most left-wing nominees to the Senate floor. It takes them much longer, and sometimes that has led to uh, us defeating the worst nominees. Of course, when you get to the Senate floor, it only takes one Democrat to defect because they realize um, how terrible a nominee would be once in office. Um, also, Democratic chairman with a 51-49 majority can unilaterally issue subpoenas. For the last two years, they've had to uh, have the cooperation of the Republican chairs. And, of course, we're just one vote away. You know, if it's 51-49, there could be a one- or two-vote Democratic majority in the uh, Armed Services Committee. Let me just give you one example. I offered an amendment last year, during, or th earlier this year, drafting our annual defense legislation that would have prohibited payment of any one of these diversity consultant charlatans in the Department of Defense any more than an E-5 sergeant makes, an infantry team leader out on the tip of the spear. Um, I don't think these charlatans should be making more than that fire team leader. It failed uh, by an evenly divided vote. But, but if Democrats have a majority, it will be that much harder to persuade one Democrat to come along with us on very sensible policies. I think you're going to get more reasonable Democrats as the 2024 map approaches. Senator Tom Cotton, happy Thanksgiving, and thank you for joining me.